So if you want to keep your opponent dancing to your tune, if you want to hit and never get hit, and if you want to be always the one who is dictating the pace of the action, you should watch today's video. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of uh, Fight Chat Friday from TKD Coach Academy. So we are Adrian Byrne and Richie Ford and every Friday we look to bring you the very, very best of ITF, Taekwondo, sparring, competition, coaching and performance. And if that sounds like a conversation you can dig your nails, your teeth into, uh, subscribe, uh, like this video and hit that bell button and every Friday we will deliver to you a little snippet of the very best of the ITF action. So Richie, uh, today we're having a chat around footwork. So how did that come about? Yeah, so we got, as most people who kind of follow us along and are kind of part of the community at this stage, you know that we're doing um, live sessions every Tuesday at the minute. So for us that are on lockdown here in Ireland, myself and Adrian, we've decided to use the time to be able to get into maybe some practical applications on some of the Fight Chat Fridays we've had. So we've done one on the Blitz for ITF Sparring, Sidekick and Banded Ole Chaggy so far. Mm. Um, so we got the suggestion this week maybe to cover a little bit of footwork. So that's the plan for this week. Maybe we're going to look at some maybe evasive footwork options, the ability to not get hit, draw your opponent, the ability to link up hands and legs really well, the, almost the idea of setups as well. We see lots of clips here today of um, people really being a step ahead of their opponent and mm. um, using pressure um, and certain steps, pivots, yeah. lateral movement, etc. Um, all of that then coming on the premise of being continuously on balance, which is extremely important. So that's the plan today. We're going to look at some really cool um, clips of decent footwork, and then we're going to use that to link our session up next Tuesday to hopefully get a bit more, whoops, get more hands on um, and get some practical steps and a bit more interactive workout as opposed to more of a tutorial style that we sure, had yeah, yeah. in the last week. So we're just going to mix, mix and match these and hopefully everybody's going to be able to take things from these every week. Um, and that's the plan for today. Yeah, and I suppose something that you said just before we started is that, you know, when you watch someone who has good movement, it just makes it look more fun. And when you're yeah. when you're growing up in the sport and you're looking at people who have really good movement, it facilitates so much more. And that makes it makes a spar fun to watch it makes a person enjoyable to watch as a competitor and i think mm. you know some of what we've picked out to highlight is just that it's you know people and movements and setups and shots that you just you watch and you you can kind of enjoy it you can um it might not be immediately obvious to people who are less familiar with the sport or looking at this from the outside of the sport um you know as to how the footwork links in and affects everything but we'll try to go through that a little bit um and you know just want to start with maybe the idea that some of the, some of the ones that we go through uh they're evasive footwork patterns they're, they're you know it's it's movement aimed at pulling that your opponent around the ring and i suppose it always looks like you're just running away and without yeah. context well yeah you are but there's a reason that you're avoiding engagement at that point in time and you know i think uh that's really going to be key in understanding look at the the footwork pattern that's happening and then try to understand what it's for and what the context is i think that's going to be the important uh, takeaway well, out of this one well of course we have a big ring to use and all of the top athletes are going to be able to use the rules and the rule set um, and the environment to their advantage and for us in itf like today we're going to see lots of clips of people who are almost like masters of this, of being that step ahead, of being able to hit and not get hit. And at the end of the day, that's, that's the, the whole aim of the game. And like you said there, you touched on 
just been fun and exciting. Like you see people here, they're almost playing tag with their with their kicks and their punches. It's just mm. like I can hit you, you can't hit me. And it's just even watching it, it's just it's exciting to watch and it just kind of gets you going a little bit and it's very um it's very entertaining to watch and um, from the outside. And then when you're in the ring and you can almost like be in that control where you can hit at will and somebody is finding it very difficult to hit you, it's 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 really fun really um to be able to be in that position. So it, it's something definitely worthwhile to pay pay real attention to your footwork. Yeah, playfulness. Um so We'll maybe start with a little bit of that evasive movement and uh, a little clip from Emmanuel Carlos, uh, the older brother of Julio Carlos. So let's have mm. a quick look. Yeah, so these guys, I know their gym is quite tight and compact. So I think I have a feeling that that really does play into their ability to move so well, to avoid people <laughs> in the gym and avoid walls and things. But two guys, their their footwork is exceptional. And you see nice little steps here to avoid and... It's kind of really just drawing their opponent out. He's like living on the edge, and like his opponent here, I think it's Miro from uh, Canada, is is finding it a hard to kind of like to squeeze and to commit to anything because he doesn't mm. want to overcommit. Because then, like the the onus is on the the person to put the pressure on, but Emmanuel is like almost a step ahead as a result. So any mistake you make, then he may, may have the opportunity to counter attack you. Yeah, and I think a big uh, thing that's kind of uh, you know not as obvious when you're when it comes to tracking down someone who's moving evasively like that, and you want to pin them, you want to push them to a corner, you have to move yourself, and so you have to move and throw your shots while in movement, and that's one of the things that maybe in particular if your if your training is very drill oriented, you don't throw your shots from unexpected, unpredicted, and guided movement. So uh, you're you're very rarely. Um, you might be following a pad to some degree, but it's uh, you know it's one of those things that you can practice and should practice is having uh, an opponent that's in motion and moving on predictably because it forces you to find a shot, a range, a distance, and a, a way of getting to the end of a shot while you're in motion. And mm. you know that's a tough. You're, you're making your opponent by moving that way. You're making your opponent find that skill. Now, of course, you can't do that if they have no incentive to come get you. Yeah, and then you have the whole idea of recovery as well. And mm. I think we have a couple of clips lined up today showing um, the importance of recovery and getting on balance ASAP to be able to throw and move mm. again if needs be. Um, but I think one of the most important things about this style is that you need to couple it with being proactive. And I think that that's so important. And Julio, yeah. for example, is a master at this. Um, he's proactive as well. He's not passive and just moving around waiting for something to happen. It's they're a step ahead and they're proactive and maybe drawing their opponent out and maybe pushing, pulling and just being that step ahead to make something happen. And you, you see this trend come up time and time again in, in today's video of the people who were able to get this off and they're, they're that step ahead of their opponent. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, maybe we, we, it gives us an excuse to jump to a classic clip here. And this is one that, you know, we featured before. We love the clip. And it's Miłosz Mosk look back in early 2000s in a Polish international match against Shevket from Ukraine. But the, that control of distance, the ability to, as you said, recover and lead into another shot, like is just really well displayed, as well as the ability to very, very quickly change direction. And there's just no better example that you'll find on the internet, I think, yeah. you know. And just speaking of fun as well, this just looks yeah. so fun. To be able to just be in that control and just to... Like it's it's not it's not great for the guy on the other side, obviously. But to to be in this control and just a just pure mastery of balance, footwork, everything is just magic to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's a, there's a real thing with Miwash as well. Of you know his shoulder movement really does sell where mm. he's going. He's quite deep in his stance at times too, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, he really does sit back into it. Like low on the knees here. This is a lovely one. Just this whole sequence. And um, moving off at that angle, coming in, coming out, push, pull, getting off at angles. Oh, it's yeah. so nice. It's just really good balanced recovery. So he, he can throw the shots from all of the positions in that sequence because he's always in balance with the intention of being able to throw a shot. But mm -hmm. as we look to the left right one here, it's the, the shoulder movement really kind of sells that he's committed one way, but he's staying right. low enough and he's keeping his center of gravity uh you know over his base of support well enough that he can very very quickly change direction and that's just you know agility really is what that is but it's mm. uh you know you notice as well that these guys who really have that 
high level footwork and the ability to um, to be evasive and not get hit you notice that they, a lot of time they'll try to draw people to the closed side bring them to the open side and then switch back and forth mm. but usually they, they will move to the side that has the more space and I think you'll probably see that a lot throughout today as well um, that they, yeah. they, they never put themselves in a position that's like the options are very limited so at all times if possible they'll, they'll try to move to the open side where there's a bit more so they might fake to the open side draw back to the close side where there's limited space and area and then go yeah. back out to where there's more space but it all just all that be that step ahead but just on that like if both people have the same facing that you know if the initial step is to that blind side shoulder it tends to force the person to pick up their front leg and open out their stance which actually exaggerates you know uh, the effect of your step to the opposite side so you know they're adjusting and widening their stance and then there's always a threat as well that rather than doubling as Miwash did there where you're going left then right you go left then cut and and go through the middle so you know one of the things that's always in the mind of the person who's following or or, or trying to track someone um going on that rabbit hunt is you know you are following but you're always open to a counterattack. So you you always have to be very disciplined with your um with your footwork, with your positioning, with your leg lifts. And that's something that if you haven't been in that position many times in training, where you have an incentive where you have to track and catch somebody, you 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 will get sloppy in your footwork. Um it's you know, because it's an emotive time. It's usually when you're losing, it's usually when there's seconds to go or where you're behind in the score or the crowd is against you you know the uh, cheering the other person on and counting them down or whatever it is so the uh you know that impetus of the sh shortening time makes it really difficult to be focused and disciplined and keep the stance right the whole time so you know that's where you see these sometimes these you know cutting counters you know? yeah and a flip side of that as you said the ability to be able to squeeze that space when you are against somebody who's evasive and very much moving laterally, the, the ability to squeeze them into one of the corners or toward the, towards the edge where there's a potential of them either exiting mm. or there's an opportunity where they have to either bail, leave the ring, or they have to commit because the space is just um, not there anymore. That That is a skill in itself as well. And to just build that constant pressure um, without over committing, as you said, mm. is a skill squeezing it has come up time and time again really on this um fight chat friday series and well done for that segue because that lets me talk about daniel jawa who was an absolute master at pulling people to that position to where they followed him they followed him he's now on the back edge and it's their time to go and he capitalizes on that and you know we we, we have plenty of clips where you will see that where he's seemingly on the back foot he's on the edge of the ring but he's the one doing the scoring yeah so Matt, this is uh, 2010, I think, in Sweden, the Euros, and he's against Igor here, who we featured last week in the yeah. Bandai series. Um, but it's the, the footwork here of being able to set his feet is what I love as well. Being able to get that dolly out to the body, reset it to the back, yes. the back kick on the open side. It's just so nice. So one, back to the back and reset. Always find that open side, and then he just evades off or out to the side. Yeah. Very nice. And I mean, okay, ideally he finds his way back into the ring rather than traveling. But, the, um, you know, even with the travel, he's got some solid scores there and he's conceding a warning. It's not the worst in the world. But like his, you know, very often his mastery was that he would pull the person, pull the person, pull the person, make them extend and force them to go. And, mm. you know, he, he was prepped for the, you know, he, he was generally quite good on the counter. But what made that dangerous as well was that at any point in time he would go to hands so he would you know very patiently pull and pull and pull and you're expecting is he going to throw this back kick is he going to throw the band -aid? is he going to have an angle dolio is he going to do whatever and then sometimes he just burst out with hands and because he could always threaten the hands it made the entry shot a little bit more hesitant i think you know you know people wouldn't necessarily you know go for it uh, completely on that entry shot and it often meant he picked a very very good counter but just a really good example of that footwork and again the balance and recovery out of the turning kick to get the foot back and enable that back kick you know rather than just throwing the turning kick and trying to come out with hands you know fit it, that in there is yeah. a skill isn't it oh definitely but yeah like that whole idea of the threat is so important as well because like when we talk, spoke earlier about being proactive versus passive yeah on this movement style like those guys who really have a threat to hit you at will, they're the guys who are able to master this counter style. And we've seen it there already with everybody that we mentioned, Milos, with the, with the Carlos brothers, etc. Like you need to really have a threat to be able to move this way. 
and then mm. people are just on that edge they're like is it time to go is it not time to go and in, in that moment of no man's land that's when they, they go and they hit you yeah and let's flip it to the other side of it and look at working from the inside of the ring out when your opponent is back towards that edge and here we have a clip from luke woods in viking cup or no that's sorry that was euros i think yeah, um, same euros as the last same euros yeah. yeah um this is just sick very nice <laughs> Yeah, throwing out a bit of a tornado in there um yeah but so, even the footwork here off this one so it's like a, it's a switch back to, yeah and then to bring the, the turning kick up from the back kick it's just the balance the and and the footwork there is just so nice yeah and you know it, it looks at the end like it was always going to be a turning kick of course but it wasn't and at, if at any point in time uh ukrainian fighter kind of steps in changes you know yeah. the kick changes and uh, you know, and Luke was always balanced enough to be able to make it into a back kick, to make it into a band aid. You know, in the middle of that uh, rotation. Um, mm-hmm. And if you can see that even even after his first one, yeah, it was like he had to go again to reach him, and that wasn't a problem. He just continued his spin. Yeah, but like he could, you always feel that if, as you said, if he stepped in, he could have adjusted seamlessly. Yeah, and it's a very. Uh, if you haven't counted that initial spin and we always say this when it comes to like a spinning combination or something like that if you don't actually count that initial one it's very hard to find your moment to step in on it mm. because you know depending on whether it goes high it goes back it goes you know it, it it all changes and you can't anticipate that really when you step back unless you know the the person throwing it is you know fairly set they only throw one but you know for someone like luke where that could be a back kick a 360 a band aid um and every now and again a 540 or something they like what you'd end up with there is a situation where you kind of have to give the space and hope that there's a, a balance error a recovery error or something that lets you come through or you have to go back go back so that you can build the timing to read the spin and go in at the right time and often that's all that you know luke wanted out of it is okay you have to give me some space fine now i have the ring again and i can pick up my sidekick and you know for many of us who trained and you know competed with Luke through the years, he's kind of remembered a lot more for or more noted for the the spinning, which never got him huge scores. But it was more noted for the the, the spinning. But it was just hammering you with that front leg side kick and the the pace and intensity of it that actually set the tone for his matches. And then the spins were just there every now and again as a burst. And you know it's the fact that they came as a burst like that that you know if you if you hadn't your, your your eye was never set on it you never you'd never settled into um a rhythm that included that and then all of a sudden they came at you it was just oh okay i'll drift back and very just often something that's all you need as well isn't it yeah it's like it's just he's so diverse and the ability to be on balance and throw a, a variety of shots it's just it goes back to that point of being threatening it's mm. like there's so many threats there and then this comes out of nowhere like whoop okay now i have to worry about this as well yeah. you know what I mean it just just gives the opponent something to think about and then that's an opportunity for you to go and do what you originally plan or to, to get on your way to scoring your own um, shots 100%. as opposed to them being in control yeah 100% and uh, we've a, we have a lovely little jump planned here where uh, we were talking about that classic clip from Miwash there where you know early 2000s um, but a decade later he was back in the polish championships uh you know in team sparring showing some of those skills and i know there's a gap in the middle there where he wasn't really training all that much and uh i don't know how much training he was doing before this but there's uh, uh some definite throwbacks but some absolutely beautiful footwork to pick up on in this little clip mm. um so this is uh Lubartov, um uh in the uh, in the team sparring and he's up against magic Zuk. so let's have a look it's important to note the size of the ring here as well. It's tiny. Well, I think they're given the red mat as well, but it's like when we're sparring at home, like there's there's there isn't that much of a safety area, you know. That's the shot. So you've got the six by six. Yeah, the drop step the is again. lovely. Yeah, like you mentioned earlier, Adrian, of that drop in the shoulder and selling that, then that comes that takes the back leg turning kick is just open, mm. and Zook has to go for that, and then it just opens them up, and this is lovely. And it's basically the same stepping movement as he played on Shevkesh. Mm. And the switching of the stance is important here as well. Yeah. Because as he opens up to now he's just actually gained an extra bit of space and it just loads his weight on to be able to push off that leg again. It's just, it's very, very nice. 
yeah, it, as you said, it, it does. It gives you, uh, in pulling the front foot back, you've gained a stance. And then as you step to the angle, you know, you've potentially gained another half a stance. So it's big. Mm. This back kick, though, back I think, kick. like, like it's common sense for you to throw that back like turning kick. Yeah. Like, he's coming into you. You're on that stance. The right leg turning kick to the body has to be thrown. He's invited he it. That. Yeah. He's invited that. He set that up. And then this one, just switch a stance, coming back. And switch a stance, coming back. So nice. So fluid on the feet. Yeah. Selling it with the shoulders as well. And I'd imagine Juke doesn't need much to get back into this match. I'd say it's a close fight. And, yeah, it's you know, close, I think. Yeah. yeah. And when it comes to team sparring, like, you know, they'll both be feeling that kind of little bit of pressure there at the end because you're doing it with the teammates. And, you know, yeah. um, it's a big deal. So, uh, you know, some lovely movement to, to get back in there. And, you know, the, the, the nice thing about it as well, as well is they're very... Um, kind of relatable patterns of footwork you know there are things that you can take out and train and work and it doesn't even have to be inspiring like the same patterns of footwork and movement will work in tag and yeah. you know that's a huge thing that you can introduce it's actually in... uh, sorry just to interrupt no, you on that one on, on the whole idea of the tag um hung hung louis actually commented when we put this up on yeah. instagram and he mentioned the same thing when he was training in lubartov that he that Milos was actually impossible to even tag in the warm up games yeah. because of that. So it, it's funny that you mentioned that. It's just so relatable. Oh, absolutely. And you know, Masiedu did have an awful lot of that kind of uh, game design in the warm ups and would let them run. Like as he said, sometimes he he would let the game of tag go for fifteen minutes because he started to recognize, you know, oh, well there are valuable footwork patterns and things being developed here. Does you know there's a positional awareness as all that, but. You know the same agility is agility so you know getting the center of gravity a little lower and over your base of support and being able to push off and change and predict the movements selling it with the shoulders and all the rest of it that's going to be just as valuable in tag as it is here so great way to practice it because mm. it's fun you know so might as well yeah. have some fun while you're training but uh we're taking a bit of a jump here and looking on a more aggressive side of it so this is letting not in any way evasive so we're taking adam shelley here um and uh you know this is definitely more on the attacking side of things yeah why well, i like this clip is because i think it really highlights the importance of being able to transition seamlessly between side facing half facing and full facing and adam mm. here quite a tall guy mostly side facing to use the leg hammers that leg in like a joust and then watch this right foot here step to the outside and yeah. that little bit of footwork is so important because the important piece is it changes his body position from side facing to full facing because you can punch correctly or effectively from side facing and it gets him back in there and he's now on top again with the hands even though that it was um, his opponent that went to hands initially. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a very, very important skill to be able to transition at will between side half and full facing especially for us in itf well yeah and his opponent in that case actually came forward to hands in a less favorable position you know mm. he was stepping outside of uh, adam's right foot in that side facing stance and adam by slipping his right foot over to the left was able to go full facing and meet someone who's coming in almost half facing you know so the the power is going to be with adam when it comes to it and he's going to be in a more balanced stance he's going to be more upright and able to push through it so yeah it, that that little adjustment and i mean the footwork part of it is all about how do we translate from you know our good base which is our stance into our effective techniques and you know th your techniques they're not effective in the wrong time or at the wrong distance and the footwork is what puts you in the right time and the right distance so true so uh we're going over to the girls here for a second and uh having a look at and i think we, we we kind of unintentionally picked a lot of the guys today so i'm going to have to fix that as we go forward but um yeah. i got a lot of enjoyment uh going back and digging up some of these ones um uh from louise mcca uh and it, we're kind of looking here at this one in terms of it's a balanced recovery thing you know in the main but it's also uh looking at um you know gaining an angle using your footwork and uh, a few nice shots yeah for anybody who doesn't know louise is one of adrian's students um and you can see the, the amount of work that they put in there throughout the years of these small subtle steps um so i know there's been a lot of work there because the girls are quite heavy-handed i feel and it's a major feature mm. of the game would you agree adrian yeah definitely can be like that you you uh, because it's just a little less explosive going forwards there's more time spent in the contact and yeah. you know 
these little slight angles here are so important. Are, are these things that you, you feel that she would have picked up through um, your training or would you have like consciously kind of worked on these slight angles and, and tried to even talk through them to see are they available or do you think it just comes from her training throughout the years of putting putting Louise in these kind of environments? Some of this kind of came from, um, you know, not necessarily planning deliberately to kind of, kind of make that small angle step. But that was like, that as a, as a principle, it's always there. Like, you know, if you're, you yeah. have to make an angle on the direct shot and that's just kind of a principle that's always been there. But uh, a lot of things that would happen would be um, Louise is a defensive fighter, uh, you know, or when she is in a defensive mode, she's really successful with the back kick. But the back kick will always put you in a position where you're traveling backwards and you need to make a recovery. So it was finding her appropriate recoveries from the back kick that would keep her in the ring. So, you know, you can often see in that clip where out of the recovery position, whether it was side kick, back kick or for Louise, it's not often as a side kick. Very often she'd have a, you know, it would be a turning kick and, you know, there'd be a lot of shin in there. Um, but the, the recovery uh, needs to change the angle as well. And then what better than, well, if you're going to change the angle, why not also be, you know, scoring? So mm. um, there, there's a ten- jump, little jump helps as well, doesn't it? To get you off yeah. that line faster even. Yeah. And I mean, there's just even in the, the first uh, e- example there, you can kind of see just that, li- uh, you know, it, it is, as you said, a little bit of a jump as going to the angle, keeping it nice and clear uh, and looking for that two point score um, mm. uh, with two punches, obviously. Um, but the the intent is always there to put the second hand on it um but yeah the recovery from that and it's looking for the angle like this is more the one that we're talking about where you have that kind of um uh foot to foot recovery and then you're looking to find the uh, by stepping out much as in the same way as the guys who were heading for the more circular movement we're pulling the front foot to the back foot and then veeing out to the side to gain a little bit of space that recovery as well stops the ease from traveling and you know that's a huge deal like for everybody the amount of warnings you accumulate is a huge deal so if you're going to have a back kick in your game as a defensive shot or a retreating side kick as a defensive shot you really need to have your next step being a recovery step um you know so you're either going directly back into contact or you're going to make a recovery step and rather than putting yourself in a worse position if your recovery step puts you in a more attacking position um you know better again uh you know Mm -hmm. you definitely want that as a principle I think. Yeah, very nice. I think that like that has definitely come true. As you said, actually, you mentioned it very, very early on in this episode, the whole idea of having moving opponents and targets coming at you as well, mm. to be able to move on that back foot and to be able to adjust your feet. Because a lot of times if you throw one back kick on a pad, for example, that's it, it's done. We reset the, jit, the drill, excuse me, and we go again. Yeah. Whereas like when it's a bit more live and there's still people coming at you in, in trying to hit you, you have to adjust. So it's either like recover and move and get off that line or you're going to be hit. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I think that's so valuable there. So we're, we're, we're taking a little bit of a trip back to Julio Carlos and some uh, shimmy shimmy left right stuff. Uh, but there is a, a lovely lesson in this and a lovely finish in this. Uh, and this goes back to 2019, uh, World Championship final again, and we did feature this one uh, in the the Band Aid episode. Yeah, so like why I like this as well is th- the fact that he's able to throw from that position is just crazy. He's always on balance and just like being able to switch seamlessly between that lateral movement where he's fully facing his opponent with his full facing position versus side facing, and just being able to switch those. His opponent doesn't know where he's going, and he's just chasing, chasing, and that's what we mentioned at the very start when your opponent is just new it's important to note here the context of the, the match as well i mean he's four nil up four nil in the up world final with very close to the end seconds left yeah exactly so like his opponent has no option but to chase julio knows this julio is a master at being ahead and making you chase him and then mm. he just pick you off and um, so he's been in this situation time and time again and this is where squeezing we mentioned earlier is so important so not really lifting on your first kick every time maybe and and following and chasing your opponent but really squeezing that space trying to limit it and yeah. um, but julio is well able to come to that open space and adjust being from side facing adjusting the body position from being side on to open to be able to move laterally to back side facing again to be able to use any kick he likes and i think there's a danger people assume this is easy to do and they you know there, there's you'll have coaches you know particularly at a, an international level who are working with athletes maybe they don't work with on an individual level very often and you say okay circle circle you know in the last 15 or 20 seconds yeah. 
and if you haven't got you know genuine experience practice and training at doing that it's it's not actually as straightforward so what will they do they'll turn sideways and they'll go foot to foot but when you watch Julio's clip there the amount of subtle change of direction or you know where it's uh, kind of you know lean right come back and go right uh, you know foot to foot steps uh, hops like crossover steps and then you know even just before that band aid going from side facing and jumping to the the normal half facing right leg and front stance to set up the band aid you know there's a lot of steps that go on there and it's all done in balance and usually what happens is if you ask someone with less experience to just go they're going to go foot to foot mostly they're going to race and they'll get faster as they go around and eventually like a, a spiral going outwards they'll just run themselves into the edge of the ring and yeah. they'll be accelerating in that direction and easy to catch and once they get clipped at all they're falling over where uh if you if you rather than looking at how fast julio is going left right left right if you were to look at the distance that he covers in the time he hasn't gone that fast there's been an awful lot more that's been you know uh that's to actually and fro. a great point can we play that again and have a look yeah absolutely and uh sorry we'll go to that one maybe just look at the distance that he's adjusting and i think that adjusting between being side facing to being full facing with his feet almost parallel is low on that as well yeah now the change of camera angle at the end actually throws it a little bit but he's done all of that clip in one quarter of the ring so like mm. he hasn't moved past the midline on this side really or the midline on that side like this is as far as he goes and you know and then it changes and throws the shot so like he's only moved a quarter of the distance around the ring which you know if you're if you're watching less experienced athletes or you know le less capable uh, evasive fighters do that what you'll often find is that they're nearly three quarters of the way around the ring you know and accelerating and then they just get clipped um you it's know it's just kind of heading in one direction really isn't it it really is and i mean the fact that he's done that much movement in effectively you know a format radius uh you know it's it, there's a lot going on and it's well worth kind of just if if, if you have a mind to try it uh to look at mm -hmm. just how much uh, kind of false signaling and messaging and, and whatever is going on there and that all has to be happening almost subconsciously because if you're thinking about what you're doing you're going to get caught you have to be doing that very much naturally and in flow and reacting to what you're seeing it has to be embedded and if it's not embedded it's not going to flow quite like that so you know get the footwork practice in by doing simpler things and you know for that one I'd always kind of say if you just start with a front push kick and tease your opponent like you know just let them try to hit you make it a small space and worst case scenario you get you know you, you get a shove um but you really do get like the advantage of playing and i think the the mm. play is a big thing here that was one of my favorite exercises as well to just right literally your job is just to, to hold a clean sheet and not can see the warning and see can you be able to do that for an x amount of time mm. your opponent and you can build up the shots they have like you said you can start yeah. with maybe a simple technique and then you can add it to hands eventually or whatever um but yeah just being able to be comfortable in that environment is very valuable because we've noted so many times here that most of the matches at the high level they will come down to this ability to be able to keep a lead or go and get a lead yeah. in the last maybe 30 seconds of a bout, especially at championships level. Um, so being able to maybe go and get that warning or not concede a warning or maybe not get hit in the last dying seconds of a match is such a valuable skill. And it's something that we actually have to practice because, as you said, if mm. you're not comfortable in that environment, you're not going to be able to do it. Yeah. I mean, people like to kind of put out this idea that, no, 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 before the scoreboards was better, you just fought and that was it like we, we were just living in an information poor era you know there was matches won and lost in the dying seconds that you just didn't know were won and yeah. lost or that were won long before the match ended um you know and you just didn't know but the, the that feeling of the reason it's difficult you know is with the scoreboard there you know you can't travel or you know you can travel you know you have one warning to spare um but with the way the rules are now you don't want to just intentionally travel because that could be unsportsmanlike conduct and you don't want to do that so you have to actually play the game which means like julio there you have to always stay engaged with the match so you know there is a real skill in it and it's worth having a good uh, a good amount of practice putting yourself in that situation and really playing through it um Absolutely. so we have a little bit of uh, yourself actually up next uh, against fatty demir from germany um so mm. you can talk us through this one 
<laughs> yeah, so it's actually a similar contest, like four 0 up with a couple of seconds left. Um, it's just it's it's kind of similar to that that sell in one direction. So I go one way and then I just switch back. Um, so it's it's kind of like that um, shoulder one that we talked about earlier. You just sell one direction and go the other direction. Mm. Um, yeah, there's not much more to it really, is there? But th- this all comes from just me being comfortable and people just kind of, kind of chasing me in the uh-huh. dying seconds yeah. and putting yourself in that situation. Because luckily for me, I all my training partners were either 57 or 63. Yeah. So practicing that with lighter guys who are faster, you're, you're pretty confident that when you go up into your own heavier divisions that people don't have that explosive ability to come and get you or to be able to, to chase you down in those dying seconds. So just having that confidence. And of course, when you're 4-0 up and you're kind of in control of the match, it's easy to do these things as well. So the mm. context is important here as well. Yeah, and I mean, it's also important that like with Fatty in particular, like his main weapon is the hands. And if mm-hmm. he can create that pressure and build a bit of momentum, he's devastating with the hands. But the, uh, you know, if if it's if if the game is already you know set and the scoreboard is already set, then the hands become more predictable because you know what are you going to do when you're under pressure? You go to the well, uh, you go to yeah. what works. So you know you can kind of make a, a safe enough prediction from your point of view that he's not going to throw a blindside dolio from there. And yeah. you know it's it's just an unlikely event. And you know. Yeah. As, as well as like what you said with Julio though it's like I wasn't allowing him because knowing that somebody's good at hands for example allowing them to pressure you back in a straight line towards the back of that ring mm. then I would have been in trouble whereas being having that open space you have so many more options so the ability to just have some space behind you and have that like being comfortable and knowing that that right I have a space to the left to the right and mm. behind me it just gives you a bit more options as well you know definitely so you were talking about your uh, 57 kilo training partners and um a shout out to thomas who probably isn't 57 kilos right now but the, <laughs> uh, uh, it might be a more fair training partner at the moment you might be coming closer yeah we're closer these days i'm coming down he's coming up i think there yeah. you go but uh um, we yeah, have segways a, are absolutely on point today uh, rocking so we have a couple of clips from thomas and i think we just let them run one into the next um because really it is just uh, a few lovely little um uh, moments of nice footwork uh, both uh, you know offensively defensively but really the the message here is it's it's the kind of it's leading your opponent on a, a merry little dance and taking them with you because you're dictating the pace the distance the tempo with your uh with your footwork so feel yeah. free to talk to those a little bit as we go mm. yeah like thomas is a master at always being on um, balance and distance he, here he is in blue um, so he's just moving around this is team sparring so he's fighting bigger guys again probably used to sparring me to be honest but he, being able to get in there and get that kick off even that is so important especially when you're against such a taller guy it's very difficult because you're almost like underneath him when he's punching mm. and just like these subtle steps and then the pressure back on again that's the important part as well I think to, that he's able to he's not just kind of settling with it and this one is lovely just to be able to manage the distance get off at that little angle come back into the center control the distance and then he's back in control here again yeah and then we'll see that just again evading shoulders here as well as important we've seen that a couple of times leading them one way going the other way and then eventually kind of gets that's really nice against gets caught eventually but look the, the footwork leading up to that is just um really really nice and i really like the, like the most important thing for this is always on balance yeah he's always able to move left or right his feet are never too far apart where he has to really transition his weight to make it a big effortful movement where he's, he's just always there ready to move left or right at the drop of a hat and i think as you said when you're looking at it as well there's always the uh, the intent to to throw a shot it's never moving yeah. uh it's never moving just to get away there's always an intent uh to get the shot to uh to follow and you look at the positioning of the head over the body you know as the movement happens like and and that's a huge part of it is you know it's here but we're going back again and you know if you fall into the pattern or the rhythm of just retreating you'll get stuck there and eventually you get cornered whereas Mm -hmm. when your intent is that you're like that's a full reversal from the corner of the ring back to the center of the ring like when you're in when when your positional awareness is good and your intent is to like is to win the matches to score points and you're looking for your opportunities to build a score like that changes everything about your uh how you move but you know mm. it's being playful as well like i mean this is very hard to do if you're uptight and stressed and yeah. fighting at you the have to like be loose and yeah, yeah. 
And you have it's, to. It's like I was. That I was going to say, you have to be able to enjoy it. You have to be able to see the game of it. Uh, and if you're in there to fight, you're not going to move like this. Like if you mm. just want to fight, I guarantee you, you're not going to move in that way. Like there has to be an element of you that wants to play a game. And when you want to play a game, then you can relax elements enough to be able to move that way. And I think that's a huge difference between like, it's so notable when you see a playful fighter at a full contact level. And I mean, we're like, we get questions the whole time or comments the whole time around full contact and it's just not our game. But, you know, the question of could the fighters transition, like could someone like Thomas go and fight full contact? Well, Thomas won't fight that way full contact. Could he transition yeah. and fight full contact? Yeah, probably, but he'd be a totally different fighter. Um, but like when you see, go back to the likes of Muhammad Ali, who is like, you know, at, even at the time, there was a lot of ridicule around some of the things that he did and how he fought. Um, you look, Prince Nassim Hamid, uh, you know, again, a very interesting one on that front. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, the notorious uh, Conor McGregor, like, I mean, and there have been others like him. And like, there's equally for every clip or every video or every fight that's done by someone like that who's being playful and that goes well, there's a video of a cocky lad getting knocked out, mm. um, you know, yeah which is the full contact alternative you know if you're playful and the other person catches you sometimes it doesn't look so good but being playful allows a certain looseness allows a certain style of movement and you know that's kind of celebrated here i think mm, and that's what i was actually going to touch upon when you said it initially uh, is conor mcgregor like everybody has seen that 15 second clip versus jose aldo and just the looseness in his body, and even Joe Rogan commentating mentions it. He's like, Connor's relaxed, he's loose, he's playful. Mm -hmm. But it's then being able to have that forward pressure that he brings, yeah. and then being able to be loose and playful on the back foot is so important. And like we've seen it against Eddie Alvarez um, and many other fights that he's had. But I was only speaking to some guys who train ITF um, last night about this, and this was because Conor McGregor is fighting tomorrow night. So that was the conversation that we had of the fact that he's very, very effective is because he brings that forward pressure and makes people almost be in that uh, like fight or flight reaction. And they have to bite eventually. And then he's so loose and set on his feet, he's able to just slip out of the way and he's able to just bang his left hand in and, and put people to sleep. And that all comes from the ability of, as you said, being loose, being playful, but with that proactivity mm. as well, which is so, so important. You can't just like do this stuff on the back foot completely and just be completely laid back. It has to be like a playful way, but you have to be proactive with it. Mm. So our last one we have is just, uh, you know, maybe I don't know if it fits into the flow of this, but we have one from Andre Lee and well, it's not just Andre Lee, it's, a, it's Russia versus Ukraine, Andre Lee from Russia. I'm not actually mm. sure who's representing Ukraine in this particular Dimitri. one. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but, so Dimitri came from uh, 63 um, to 57 for this world. But I, I think it's important here to see Dimitri's balance. Dimitri's in red. Um, yeah. But the, the ability to test set blitz and get that fit that kick in there as well is so important but look at his feet here 50 percent 50 50 balance push pull push pull he's he's building rhythm tempo pressure and then fit that kick in there yeah that's impressive well, um, so really nice footwork yeah he's you know he set the rhythm and then broke it and we're always yeah. talking about how effective that can be but i love the answer here which is look i'll do the same to you you know yeah, and yeah. you know that uh we actually come at the next clip after this uh, sequence is Andre Lee reading it. Uh, but, you know, uh, Dimitri's been successful twice. And then, uh, you know, it, uh, Andre does figure it out and there's a uh, draws him into it almost like. But that little uh, angle. Similar it's to a Louise. beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful little angle. He does it on the opposite side. But yeah, it's an it's a beautiful little angle. Um, Louise will do this yeah. gen generally from left leg in front and Andrew's gone right leg in front there but it's you know it, it, it is a lovely angle that uh, he makes on that shot yeah, and it's Dimitri a with a sidestep here as well is nice and just that pressure the forward pressure you see and then he's setting that rhythm breaking that rhythm like you said forward the test step we call that yeah and then but like he gets it most of the time but the fact that Andrew Lee is such a high level fighter you know world champion in his own right I'm yeah. um, not sure. If, I think it might even be this championships. Um, but he's able to read that maybe on the second, third or fourth one. But most people, if you can catch them once on breaking that rhythm, it's probably going to be there for you all fight. 
it just happens that Andre is such a, a high level guy that he's able to pick up on it um, yeah. and he's able to get that but most guys if you set that rhythm with that footwork and you're able to get it off you'll probably have it all day long yeah I mean one of Andre's key skills is generally speaking uh, he controls distance very very well keeps you on the end of that long leg and when you do sneak in his arms are you know uh, he, he does keep the range there very well generally um, but I love that little step um you know we're, just, nice, yeah. we're going over here we'll go this way for a moment and then you know step back against it it's a a, a very kind of a yeah classic angled movement and just plays out beautifully there as well mm. but uh you know for me that is the essence of footwork is it's telling your opponent a story but you know the ending and yeah, you know yeah. uh, they don't nice know the ending it. yeah and, and it has to be leading and following and you know that's where we're all more comfortable following and that's where for the top uh you know for the, the the top competitors being able to step away from that to actually dictate and tell the story for four minutes is very mentally challenging and you know you need to be well enough practiced that the skill that what's going on below the waist is you know unconsciously competent it's it's that mm -hmm. thing where you're not having to think about how you move your feet anymore you're just you have a broader intention and your feet just follow it's the whole idea of, of chunking here is such mm. an important concept of footwork because it's the subtle cues of the body position, the shoulders, all these things. They're, they're tells that we take in subconsciously and react to. Um, so like even there, people can use them on the reverse then as well. You see Milos understands that if you lead somebody this way, they naturally go for that back leg turn and kick. Yeah. And that opens them up to set you up for the back kick. And um, so it's these guys who are that level ahead. It's just so impressive and it's a joy to watch. So maybe we'll summarize a little bit of the, the training of it and a, a few kind of important reminders and cues. Um, so uh, just a few, six simple tips there and we will go and build them up through a, a bit of a, a pyramid as well. So in terms of how you develop it with training, but um, you know, I think Miwash uh, and, and even with some of the, uh, like the, the defensive balance and reactive stuff like Louise, like balance is super important and that's linked to recovery. Um, so whatever you were throwing before, however you were moving before, that you always have the balance to make, uh, you know, to, to not be forced into your next action. So that you're always in control and the movement is always pur purposeful. I think that's huge. I think um, as well, it, it's, it's quite um, individual in terms mm -hmm. of like the stance length you're going to have and things like that. The position, are you going to be tall in your stance, low in your stance? It really comes down to your own body type and your yeah. genetic makeup. And you kind of have to be able to find your own way of being on balance. So that's kind of something you need to play with, really. Absolutely. And then, you know, speed isn't even always a thing. But like, you know, the, uh, everyone wants to be faster and they assume faster is going to be better. But you can really cheat speed with a lot of things, like with distance, with rhythm, with, you know, with your reading of a, a, a fight, you can cheat speed. But as you said, adding speed over bad uh basics bad movement patterns like bad yeah. movement patterns it, it just leads to a train wreck so you want to smooth out the movement patterns first before adding the speed and that's why balance is number one in this kind of like not even a hierarchy but like it's number one on the list yeah because like if you if you're doing it with speed but the balance isn't there then it's useless yeah and likewise when you add the next point to that of linking it with the techniques i mean if they if the footwork doesn't lead to throwing a shot or you know something that way it's not actually purposeful so um you know training it solo or just in isolation i know that's one of our points later on it, it's not the way to go and you know mm -hmm. I, I think later on we're talking about it more in terms of the environment but you know train your footwork with techniques with shots with recoveries and it will definitely pay dividends Oops, didn't even know I could do that. There you go. Um, so do you want to talk through the last few there? Yeah, so we have practice in live and semi-live sparring environments. So we'll see, like, it kind of links into this next one. Uh, don't train um, your footwork in isolation. So a lot of time, like, when I was trying to improve my footwork, because as I said, this was something that really interested me, the whole idea of being able to be playful and move and not get hit. And, like, even watching people like, Daniel Giola and uh, Milos back in the day, I really wanted to be able to move like this and to be able to like almost be playful. Um, and what you do is you just start practicing the movement patterns in isolation over and over and over again. And that's okay in terms of you just get that foundation level. 
But if you can't link that up to what we already spoke about in terms of the timing, the distance, the techniques that go with it, and um, the, the real life interaction and dynamics with an opponent, it, it's not going to be effective and you're not going to be able to pull it off. So being able to bring these movement patterns from isolation, we'll see it next in the pyramid, mm. but to be able to bring them into um, semi-live, where we talk about semi-live, where maybe to move a pivot step, kind of like we've seen with Andre Lee and Louise, your opponent is just going to attack you with a sidekick, and all they have is a sidekick, and you just have to pick out the right opportunities to fit that in there. And then a live is a bit more um, where there's, there's more things involved. Spar. Yeah. Closer to a real spar, exactly. So you have to be able to build up to that. It's very, very important. You can't just train your footwork using hoops and isolation steps and moving around all day long. Shadow sparring, it's not going to translate if you, if you can't link it up. Mm-hmm. And then finally, um, just kind of like a, a pet peeve I have of mine is why I put it in here originally is like don't spend all your time training generic or footwork um, that comes from different sports. You need to be able to, to translate that into what we do. And Adam Shelley was a great example in today's clip of being able to do that. Adam has a, a good background in boxing, but he doesn't he doesn't fight in his boxing footwork. I know Adam is actually training MMA, and he's not using his ITF Tip footwork ITF specifically. Style, yeah. You have to be able to mold it to what you're doing. It's so important. And even the whole idea of generic footsteps you see like people doing like the ladder drills and like open and close your legs going through a ladder and fast footsteps and they say oh we're footwork training it's like yeah but like it's like level one of the pyramid which we'll see next yeah i think we better just jump into that pyramid to make that make sense but yeah that's definitely yeah. on your fms at the bottom your fundamental movement skills and your generic agility drills the, the ladders the hoops things like that anything where you're just looking at normal running patterns striding patterns uh, hopping patterns and so on and basically anything that you can think of that anyone uh, has ever put on a YouTube video in a ladder uh, probably qualifies actually, there. It's actually hilarious that like we did a few clips on these and we like gave loads of specific types of the important ones, at least what we think are important. Yeah. And then it was, remember the one you did, Adrian, of like, oh, a, it was a, like a, a jumping jack of... with a hop or something or uh, with a yeah. heel, heel lift. Yeah. Yeah, that was the one and the thing absolutely took off and it went like thousands of likes on it and thousands of views. Um, so it's, it's just mad what people consider to be like relevant, real training and relevant to what they are. Like that's only like foundation level stuff. You need to be able like the coordination there is important. Of course, you can't have the, the top of the pyramid stuff without being on balance and being coordinated. Yeah. But you can't live there. You can't expect to, to, to do generic footwork steps from from american football and all these other stuff and then be able to go into the ring and be able to move around like julio and the boys you know it's just not going to work like that no for sure for sure and as you said it builds up very very quickly though because like if you have that good fundamental movement skills base you move well as a human being you're physically literate okay so that's you know and and that shouldn't be underestimated because you know Mm. more and more kids aren't arriving to our gyms that way um but you know if you have good basics and you move well then we can uh, step that up and agility basically is about change of direction it's about loading and distribution of weight and you know it's uh, that stretch shortening cycle of you know you're loading and unloading explosively and you know that change of direction there's so many inventive ways to play with it but they're still not specific to sparring until you do it in some sparring specific steps and environments yeah. And um, um, but like even like what you mentioned there, it's so important. Like I know you have a program specifically for your younger group of the fundamental movement skills and mm. um, of, of getting that in and training that it's so important. But then like there's a balance there. Like I see on Instagram these days with um, it's very difficult with lockdown and isolation, obviously. But most of the people that not most, but a lot of stuff that people are sharing online, they're almost like aerobics classes. I was like, there's a point yeah. where you need to be able to link this stuff up to Taekwondo training. We're training Taekwondo. Where it's not like a fitness workout. It's not like an aerobics workout. There, there's a, there is a balance there that, that we need to get. And obviously, as I always say, context is key, and we don't mm-hmm. know the context for everybody. But um, just to be aware of that for anybody who's listening and interested in this stuff, um, don't fall in love with the, the, the flashy stuff on YouTube, like the aerobics workouts and stuff that looks great and it makes you feel like you're giving a great class. It, we're, we're trying to build up that pyramid, and, and that's, that's the plan here. Yeah, so I guess the challenge for us then on Tuesday is to make sure we show some of the crossover from the fundamental movement skills and agility into some sports specific steps and then a bit more of a challenge for us to hit the semi-live and live sparring environment. We won't really manage that over Zoom or YouTube, but uh, we'll definitely try and give some examples uh, towards that tail end. 
so but, I put yeah. it up here in the cards as well guys um, I did a YouTube video before on this um, how to actually go through these steps with a couple of examples so I link that up for anybody who wants to look at these um, as well to get an idea because obviously right now in lockdown we can't train with any partners and all the work we're doing is isolation and um, so we can't really give you the, the the upper tiers of the pyramid right now so go and check out that video if you're looking for examples there I think I have some examples I will link it up in the cards above perfect so i think that brings us very much to the end of our chat for today uh which is plenty i think for a friday um mm. but the intention is absolutely to take anything that we talked about today uh any questions that come forward over the next couple of days into tuesday evening session uh 7 15 uh irish time uh and live on youtube uh, so you should be able to see that linked on monday um we'll, we'll we'll put a link up there for everybody to check out and to uh uh, save the date and save the time um so yeah i think the the big thing would be to make sure if you do have questions on footwork if there's anything you'd like explained challenge try you know let us know and we'll try and explore that mm, or maybe even specific parts of the pyramid that you're struggling with you don't understand or maybe even a specific step maybe mm. it's that pivot step and you're, you're trying to you're kind of not quite getting it or maybe you're getting caught maybe we can talk through some tips and things that we have um, as we said so we'll try to give you different varieties of footwork that we talked about not just like the movement and evasive stuff also linking up things that we've seen um, in today's video and uh, we'll try to give a bit of context with that hopefully lead it towards um, the upper tiers of that pyramid and we'll definitely hit those once we can get back into our classes and get involved with our students again so yeah if, if you've enjoyed today's video footwork I know something that um, is a really interesting topic for people and it's something that they look up a lot so yeah. if it's something that you enjoyed and you took something from today's session please hit this video a like it does us wonders for youtube algorithm gets us out there to more like-minded people so we would really appreciate that subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and we hope to see you guys on tuesday very good happy friday <laughs>